All right, uh, welcome to the January Market Outlook. We'll get started here in just 15 or 20 seconds. Um, we have a lot of people uh, piling into this month's blockchain.com podcast, and we'll be joined by a very special guest, Jeremy Allaire and Dr. Kara Kyleman. So just stay tuned here, another 15 or 20 seconds, and we'll get started. Thank you for joining us today. All right, I see people are piling in, that's good. I think we'll go ahead and get started. Um, so my name is Nicholas Carey. I'm the co-founder of blockchain.com and I'm also the co-founder of the uh, Blockchain Commission for Sustainable Development and the author of The Future is Decentralized. I'm very excited to share um, sort of a summary of what we've been seeing in the markets over the past 30 days. We've entitled this one 2022 Higher. Um, so next slide, please. So a little bit about blockchain.com. Um, for those of you that don't know, we're one of the most popular places for people to start their cryptocurrency journeys. And uh, there are a couple sides of the company now. And I'll talk to you a little bit about those. Um, so if you didn't know, we've had about 80 million people sign up for a blockchain.com wallet over the past 10 years. And those users have performed over a trillion dollars of on-chain transactions. And blockchain.com continues to be a really popular place for people to begin their crypto journey. If they're curious to learn more about what's happening on-chain and then also use tools, to help them access new and emerging cryptocurrencies. So there's sort of two sides of the business. There's the consumer side of blockchain.com where you can download a wallet from the iOS, Android or app store and sign up online as well, it's totally free. And um, within 30 to 60 seconds, you can begin your cryptocurrency journey. We also have a professional trading venue called blockchain.com exchange. So if you're um, a broker or someone a little more advanced, um, you can access the liquid markets there uh, across many, many pairs. We have the blockchain.com explorer where you can look up everything from uh, Bitcoin to Ethereum prices to uh, your favorite NFTs. And we regularly launch partnerships um, with all kinds of exciting companies um, to explore different ways that cryptocurrencies can be used. On the institutional side of the blockchain.com house, we do everything from lending to over the counter and spot trading. We have liquidity and execution uh, services, DeFi projects where we are participating um, in the market we also have asset management and a custody offering for protocol projects. So really an entire prime brokerage wrapped up among a bunch of other things as well. It's been a busy uh, year for us, uh, but also the last month um, we've been shipping. So we've completely redesigned uh, the wallets. So if you haven't already updated your iOS or Android wallet, please do so. Um, that was a major effort from uh, the mobile team to blockchain.com over the end of the year and got that done before the 31st. Uh, we made a bunch of changes and improvements to the trading limits to simplify those. Uh, so the rules that govern um, how much you can trade over a given period of time have all been um, updated. We also launched NEAR, a very exciting new crypto protocol on the blockchain.com exchange. And um, we launched an NFT marketplace um, sign up. Uh, so hundreds of thousands, I think over a million people have expressed interest. Um, NFTs were certainly a major category of interest and development um, over the previous year. And uh, in response to the consumer demand, we're very excited to be integrating um, different ways for people to interact with non-fungible tokens within the blockchain.com experience. Okay, so um, this month's uh, rewards rates for different cryptos. So if you want to um, get um, uh, have your crypto work for you while you sleep, uh, these are the different rates that you're able to achieve uh, in qualifying jurisdictions. Next slide. And a quick reminder, the blockchain.com exchange, uh, if you are trying to advance um, up the learning curve a bit, this is a great way uh, to buy, sell, trade. Um, Margin was launched last month in qualifying jurisdictions as well. So the advanced traders have been looking for um, different venues to uh, get margin are also eligible now on the blockchain.com uh, pending the jurisdiction that you live in. And a quick shout out here, we are hiring. Um, we've just clipped past about 500 people across the whole firm and we have um, well over 80 open positions. And so uh, if you are interested in starting um, a journey joining a cryptocurrency company, please visit blockchain.com uh, blockchain for slash careers. Um, and we have roles across every department. So you don't just need to be a cryptocurrency expert or an engineer, although we do have a lot of those roles. Um, there are many functions we're adding muscle across the entire company. And we would love to have you send your resume in or uh, share with your friends. If you know anyone that would be interested, um, we'd love to talk with them. Okay, last time we spoke, uh, we looked at what happened in the market. Um, and we had a special guest, Charles McGuera, the head of markets at blockchain.com, who regularly um, opines on research in the macro and both micro uh, crypto markets um, to talk about what was happening in November. So uh, if you didn't catch that, you can find it on YouTube and on your favorite streaming venues. 
Okay, today's focus. Um, we're going to uh, have an overview of what happened in December from Dr. Gary Heilman and our blockchain archaeologist that looked at what happened on chain. And our special guest today is Jeremy Allaire, the co-founder and chairman and CEO of Circle, who I'll be introducing formally in just a minute. So we'll get through the uh, market outlooks and on-chain insights here uh, in just a moment. So please uh, welcome Dr. Gary Kyleman, the head of research at blockchain.com and one of the most cited cryptocurrency and blockchain technology researchers. Uh, he created and taught the first uh, UK class on blockchain technology at the University of Cambridge. He's authored tons of leading research on cryptocurrencies, markets, and stable coins. So I'm sure I'll have a lot of questions uh, for Jeremy about that. He was ranked one of the most influential economists uh, and is regularly asked to share his research and perspectives with government organizations, FT, BBC, CNBC, many more. So uh, welcome, Dr. Uh, Dr. Gary Cowan. Thank you, Nick. We're going to get quickly through the market summary here so we can talk with Jeremy. Uh, so just, you know, we're, we're looking back on 2021 and crypto had another phenomenal year. Uh, you know, uh, Bitcoin uh, up 60%, Ethereum up 400%, mini coins up 1,000 or even 10,000%. Uh, truly a, a watershed and historic year for crypto assets. And I think um, just as importantly, there's a real sense now more than ever that, that this is not going away, that this is very much a part of the economic and financial landscape uh, and permanently so. There's still some doubters out there a uh, few holdouts who haven't embraced this this notion that crypto is here to stay, but but it clearly is, and the market uh, responded accordingly, and, and is recognizing there's a lot more to the space also than just Bitcoin and Ethereum, as we've been trying to point out by um, in our podcasts on these webinars, talking with uh, with uh, other uh, protocols and and other players in the space beyond the big two. Um, what's also striking um, about what happened last year is is gold uh, just down 4% in a year where we have the highest inflation we've seen in, in close to four decades, uh, you know, is just quite stunning. And Goldman Sachs out yesterday suggesting that Bitcoin can go to $100,000 or more if it starts to eat further into kind of the store value uh, kind of uh, category. Uh, you know, that's been our thesis for a long time. And, and we've written about this. If you go back to the, the, the blog post from a few years back, you know, the hardest asset is ironically virtual is the title of that post where we argued that, you know, Bitcoin is, is not just digital gold, it's digital gold plus. Uh, it certainly could be a, a, an inflation hedge, but it also offers a heck of a lot more. It supports even stable coins, which we'll be talking about here shortly. Um, stocks were up almost 30% on the year, uh, bonds down. The US dollar quite strong. And a lot of people are looking at that and saying, oh, you know, that explains why, why gold is off. But you have to remember the US dollar was only strong against other uh, fiat currencies like the yen, you know, and, and so on. Uh, it certainly wasn't very strong against uh, the crypto space. Uh, on chain, we saw a decline in, in, uh, in activity uh, on the Bitcoin network in December. So this fits with kind of the, 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 the you know, the decline in, in price we saw. Um, and I think one of the themes we're going to be exploring for 2022 is we're going to start to see, I think, some of these fundamentals feed into pricing a bit more directly. I think in the past, there's been a bit of a, you know, there's there's been certainly a correlation with fees going up on the Bitcoin network as price goes up. Um, but but I think we're going to start to see even tighter uh, correlation between fundamental uh, activity and, and pricing in crypto networks. So uh, we'll write more about this in the monthly blog post that will be up here shortly. All right. So now on to the main event, we've got uh, a longtime crypto OG, Jeremy Allaire, co-founder, chairman, and CEO of Circle with us. Uh, Nick and I have known Jeremy for a number of years now. We're very excited to have him on the blockchain.com webinar and podcast. Welcome, Jeremy. Thank you. I'm uh, pretty, uh, pretty psyched to be here. Thanks so much. And great to see both of you guys. So, Jeremy, um, I remember meeting you in 2013 in Dublin um, at the MoneyConf uh, almost a decade ago. So it's always been a pleasure to catch up with you. We have a little tradition here on the blockchain.com podcast. Um, the first question we ask everybody is, how did you earn your first buck? Yeah, I mean, you know, <laughs> it, it's interesting. I, I, the, the, there's a couple, a couple things. So my technically, I guess my first job was I was a paper boy. Uh, mm -hmm. So I, I think that was actually like, you know, the, my first non-allowance, like, <clears throat> you know, job. Um, but I actually, you know, I, I had, uh, I had lemonade stands 
before then. So I think I earned a dollar um, with lemonade stands, but I was way ahead of my time. I think I was probably eight years old in Philadelphia at the time and had a lemonade stand and put a bookstore next to it. So I, I did, you know, lemonade with a selection of books, um, which was, which was pretty innovative, but um, I, I have a, another little piece on this, which is um, my first company. Uh, so I actually created a company uh, when I was 14 um, and it was called Allaire sports cards. And it was a trading cards business. So I did OTC trading uh, on the playground. Uh, I did wholesale <laughs> liquidity. Uh, uh, and, and it's a funny story because my parents, um, I, I had received a small amount of money from when one of my grandparents passed away. And it was like a college fund thing. And I can, and my parents put it in mutual funds, which was, you know, the thing to do in the eighties. And, um, and, but I was like, like into uh, sort of um, statistics and predictive, uh, predictive using, you know, statistics to predict baseball. Uh, Bill James was this author. And, uh, and so got really excited about, Hey, I could like model and forecast, you know, like who the right players were going to be and, and then use that to speculate and trade. But anyway, that was really when I, when I started to earn, you know, a little bit more, but it's like 14 year old trading crypto, I guess, <laughs> or I NFTs really. Yeah. Amazing. All right, Garrett, you fire off first question. Right. So, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's awesome to have you on, on Jeremy and, and circle is one of the oldest, uh, crypto companies, uh, and, and, uh, you know, your wallet that you created, um, I think was one of the first really, truly beautiful, elegantly designed wallets, uh, easy enough to use for my, my mother. Um, but circles obviously evolved quite a bit from when you started. Can you talk about your original vision? What's changed and what's remained the same, uh, yeah. through the years? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, it's, it's really interesting in, in, um, you know, in, in late 2012, early 2013, when Sean and I who co-founded it, were were really thinking about this, like there, there are a whole bunch of ideas that we got really excited about. <clears throat> and back in early 2013 in the crypto space, obviously there was Bitcoin and, and you guys were, were, uh, were obviously, you know, way, way out in front <clears throat> on that and, and, and the whole space, but um, you know, as I'm like a technologist by background and have worked on programming languages and protocols and infrastructure and all kinds of stuff like that in my career. And I got really excited about, um, you know, looking at this as like an infrastructure layer for the Internet. And the, the ideas that got me into this and what, what, what kind of were the ideas behind Circle as well were, you know, in early 2013, there were people who were talking about how could you issue other assets on top of the Bitcoin network, right? So at, at, the, at that point, sort of the assumption was like Bitcoin had first mover advantage and all of the advancements in terms of extensibility, programmability, all these things could happen in Bitcoin and, and the developer community would kind of build that up. But I was looking at it as this is going to be a platform where you're going to be able to build, you're going to be able to express other assets and you're going to be able to program those by taking the script capability in Bitcoin, making it a more of a full-fledged virtual machine. And this idea of smart contracts, which was mostly ideas on napkins then, um, you know, was captured our imagination. And, and we were really interested in how could you create what we called back then an HTTP for money. And, and for us, we were thinking about how could you take what we think of as traditional money, which, you know, fundamentally is the liability of a central bank, and express that as a digital currency and transact it with all the features of cryptocurrency. So instant, global, frictionless, open, interoperable, nearly free. And that was really what got us excited was that we thought over five to 10 years that you could see protocols for traditional money working on these networks, um, complementary to Bitcoin, in fact, um, and and that that would kind of make the movement of value work the same way we move data and information. And so that was what animated us. And so we, um, you know, to come back to your question more specifically, you know, we, we sought out to build like a digital currency bank infrastructure and company. And so we wanted to do this 
as a regulated firm that's sort of in a hybrid world where we sit at the at the intersection of the existing fiat money system and this and the, and and the new kind of public blockchain digital currency realm. And um, uh, I, I actually I remember uh, one of my first uh, like I did like a, a user group uh, meeting in London and um, uh, you know and and laid out here's this vision for a hybrid thing and all this sort of stuff and I was like you know the anarchists were standing on tables like saying like you know you know you, you're going to turn us over to the NSA like this is you know I was it was literally it was it was a, a, a quite a memory but um, uh, but I think that the idea was this hybrid model and. So the first thing we built, as you as you mentioned, was a consumer product, and we really believe that for end users, they could have a wallet that was interoperable with any other wallet that could speak these protocols. And Bitcoin protocol was sort of the only protocol that had reach, but we wanted to create a way to seamlessly move fiat through that. So you could, as as you may know, um, or you probably remember, like you could take pound sterling or dollars, and you essentially could transmit those directly to a Bitcoin address. And it was instant. So we had to build a lot of things to make that work um, that then spawned other businesses like our trading business. But um, that that was sort of the idea is like you could beam around fiat using digital currency as the medium of exchange. And we were sort of waiting for things like tokens to exist as a primitive that you could build on. And you know, for a variety of reasons, um, you know, late 2016, we, uh, we, we made a decision to stop using Bitcoin as the technology, and we, we, we made a decision to rebuild on Ethereum. Um, and we announced, uh, 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 at the time, it was a pro an open source project codenamed Spark, which was designed to build a fiat protocol on Ethereum. Um, and that became USDC. And that's what ended up launching USDC. And so kind of coming full circle, as it were, like in the sort of second iteration of solving this problem, we looked at it from the perspective of actually now we can build the protocol. We can build a protocol and a money format and we can make it a general, generally available market infrastructure as opposed to a single consumer product and let everyone else build products and services on top of it and around it. And that's sort of how we, we, we approach things with, with USDC, which is a very, very different approach. And, but that's you know, got you know, really strong product market fit and, and grown a lot. Definitely. Let's and, talk about what, that. Yeah, go, go ahead, ahead, Nick. I was going to say, know. so let's talk about USDC um, and define some terms. So, uh, Jeremy, what is USDC? And for the layman, what is a stable coin? Yeah, so uh, uh, we originally, when, when we had, had the first white paper about it, we talked about fiat tokens. That's not very catchy. Uh, you know, people don't want to talk about what fiat token are you using? Um, but, and that was not intended to be like the brand or whatever that people would use. And then the industry adopted this concept of stable coins. We describe USDC, if you read our materials on our website as a dollar digital currency. Um, and, uh, and that, that really is what we think of it as. Um, but, um, the, I think the, the term stable coin captures a lot of different things. Um, and, and, and it, it, it captures, you know, really, um, you know, tokens that are, are designed to maintain stable price relative to something else. So stable price relative to a fiat currency, like a dollar or a euro, or stable price relative to say the price of gold or some other asset, right? Um, so they're often referred to as either, you know, asset backed. And so therefore they're, they're pegged in a sense or asset by, by being backed fully by the asset that the token represents or they, they can be synthetically pegged uh, using a variety of mechanisms. Um, but at a high level, you know, uh, uh, the, the, the concept stable coin, right, it, it exists. Uh, the, the word stable uh, is, is used because, you know, historically digital currencies like Bitcoin or Ether have been highly volatile. They're not stable. And that's been a really big, you know, knock on, the use of these as a medium of exchange or a unit of account, it's really hard to use something like Bitcoin as a medium of exchange or a unit of account because the, the value relative to something like a dollar moves so much and because goods and services and labor and taxes and other things are denominated in these other mediums of exchange and units of account, it, it, it's, really, it's really troublesome um, to, to do that. Um, so I think from our perspective, though, when we think about USDC, we think of it as 
a protocol and a money format. Um, and, you know, the, and I'm like an internet technology guy. And so I, I, I use a lot of analogies from that. You have like HTTP is a protocol for transmitting structured data uh, between computers and HTML is a, is a format uh, of, of content that you can deliver through that. And so USDC is both a, a, a sort of a form factor, the token itself is a form factor for a dollar. And then USDC operates as a protocol that has a set of features that enable it to be transacted, exchanged, transmitted on a, on a, public, on a public network. And so the, the analogies are, are useful in that, like we have protocols for connecting everybody together through a common email system, like the, the SMTP protocol or the, or the web protocols, like I just described, or SMS protocols that make sure that no matter what operating system, no matter what device, no matter what carrier, we can, each, we can interoperably exchange text messages. And so we need that. We need that for money. And, um, and you know, from our perspective, we, we want to make sure that, um, you know, this, this is a, a full reserve uh, of dollars and, and, and do dollar referenced assets that, that back the tokens that are issued uh, to then use as a, as, a, as, a, as a digital form factor. Awesome. So uh, I, I want to come back because um, you touched on the, the medium exchange kind of feature of, of money and how Bitcoin and Ethereum have struggled there because of their volatility to become widely used mediums ex of exchange and use of account. And, and one of the things in your original vision that I think you communicated very forcefully was this idea that money should be more like a text message uh, or an email. It should be you know quick to send, instantaneous, yeah. almost free. And, and we're still not quite there yet you know, in the crypto space as well. Um, you would see fees on Ethereum skyrocket this past year. I wanted to ask you about that original vision, um, yeah. how stable coins fit into that and, and what does it take for us to get there? And is that really the missing ingredient to seeing stable coins move beyond just this creature of the crypto asset space and into everyday life for buying the proverbial cup of coffee? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, very much in our original vision was this idea that you could um, you could take traditional money, uh, liabilities of a central bank, express it in a digital currency form and transact it over public protocols on public blockchains at, at you know, instantly with you know, final settlement, high security assurances and, and effectively free or, or nearly free. So definitely that's what we believed technologically would become possible. And it is actually, we've reached that point now. It's how widely is the is are the protocol um, are the protocols for stablecoins that that allow for that um, instantaneous and free transaction. We're, we're we're moving there extremely fast. So, you know, USDC when we first introduced it, the only viable blockchain that we could build the protocol on was Ethereum, um, and Ethereum, um, as we all know, has has had enormous success. And lots of other protocols are built on top of it, and it's uh, and and it has uh, you know the 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 supply demand of people who want to use the digital commodity, which is needed to to fund transactions on the network and use the compute and transaction processing of the network. The demand for that commodity has grown a lot, and and therefore the the price of using that energy, in a sense, has gone up as well. And so those fees have gone up. Um, at the same time. You know, our belief, and, and this is actually also something that's captured in the original white paper behind USDC, was that um, we are we are in the we believe then and still believe now that we're in the early stages of competition for these new operating system layers on the internet. And um, blockchain networks like Ethereum um, are are effectively like a special purpose internet operating systems for a new class of applications that that solve some really hard problems that you can't solve with an operating system run on a centralized server. And so there is intense competition in these operating system platforms. Uh, these third generation blockchains are competing to solve the, the trilemma of, you know, of, you know, security, decentralization, um, and, and scalability. And, um, you know, we're seeing really significant growth. We've seen growth in 
third generation chains like Solana, Avalanche, Terra, Near, which you guys talked about, and there are many, many others. You know, Hedera, Algorand, um, and 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 you know, others that have been around for some time, like Tron and Stellar, and 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 others. But there's intense competition, and um, that competition is for the hearts and minds of developers. But it's also ultimately like the 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 nodes that connect to these networks and 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 drive them. But today, um, USDC can be used on multiple chains. And you can have transaction settlement finality in as low as 400 milliseconds with transaction throughput of 50,000 transactions per second, which is consumer scale. And with a transaction fee that's like a, um, you know, a, a 20th of a penny. Um, that's pretty good. Like that's, that's good. So like that's today. Now, what we, what, what this is sort of like the infrastructure layer. And, I, and again, using the earlier internet analogies, like, we're kind of going through like the, the dial up to broadband upgrade right now. And if you remember what it was like when you had dial up, obviously that was awful. It was the worldwide wait, it was a bad experience. And then when you got to broadband, broadband was a little slow to get started. It was kind of like a little bit of fits and starts. You get the ISDN or whatever, you know, these sort of like kind of, it was kind of like, yeah, it's a little bit better, but it's still not great. And the promise of, you know, high definition video streaming or video calls or, you know, high fidelity games or all the stuff that you'd get, you couldn't quite do those. But then broadband kind of came online and there's like a CapEx expansion that took place. That's what's happening right now with these third generation chains. And it's happening at a rapid pace. And it's even happening with Ethereum, as we know, with layer twos, like expanding very quickly. And so the bet that we made really starting about a year and a half ago was, we're going to move to a multi-chain future. There's going to be this competition. We want to make it as seamless as possible for people to operate across these chains. And consumer scale apps, wallets like the blockchain wallet and, uh, and, and lots of other wallets are, are going to support these protocols. And that'll be invisible to the end user at the end of the day, right? They're not going to care like did this route over the Solana network to get that cup of coffee. Um, that's going to be, you know, people who create software for consumers and businesses and others that make that super seamless, just like we don't care that my Gmail is using SMTP, right? I just know it just works, right? So I think we're getting there. And, you know, a lot of people ask, you know, what's going to, what's going to take to get to that proverbial cup of coffee? I think we're going to see over the next 12 to 24 months, really dramatic expansion in consumer reach, uh, and, and, and availability and, and consumer scale businesses that are adopting this, um, beginning to adopt it because the economics are so important, so good for businesses to do this. Yep. Um, you mentioned uh, a number of chains that USDC is on in addition to Ethereum. And I just wanted to, to maybe we could just touch on those. What, where, where does US, USDC exist today? And then also how you think about, um, you know, supporting um, chains. I mean, how much are you waiting to see whether something's getting traction and then moving USDC onto it or, or actually saying, oh, I really like this technology, this, this, you know, this protocol. I think it's got great promise. We're going to get ahead of the market. Yeah. You know, that kind of. Yeah. <clears throat> so. Um, today, um, USDC is on Ethereum. I'm looking at a dashboard here. So uh, Ethereum, Solana, Algorand, Avalanche, Stellar, Tron, Hedera. Um, and you, you'll see it on more chains. You'll see it on, on you know, more chains and you'll see it on, on officially supported on more L2s. So um, we'll continue to do that. Um, we, you know, we look at a variety of, of factors um, um, and usually it has to do with is there a strong use case um, in, in a given environment? Is the technology sound? Is it, is it secure? Um, does it meet the, sec the security and, and, and operational requirements that, that we know are needed? Um, and, um, and a whole series of other things. There's a very comprehensive kind of review on that. Um, and, but it, but it, it isn't necessarily like, let's wait and see you know, how big something gets like Solana, we adopted very early and it was because we were very impressed with the technology, very impressed with um, the, 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 the foundation and the labs and the team that was building it. And we could see very clearly that it was going to solve some problems in crypto capital markets um, that hadn't been solved. Um, and, um, 
And so we also had a, a very strong pre-existing um, partnership with FTX and, um, and, and it was going to be something that was really important to what they're doing. And so, you know, we, 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 we came out with that fairly early. Um, but, you know, if you go through each one of these, you know, there's, there's a pretty interesting case in terms of the, the community around it, the problem space, the products, et cetera. Um, and, you know, you're now starting to see chains that are emerging that are specialized around, say, small footprint mobile devices, or you're seeing chains that are specialized around, um, you know, gaming as a vertical or um, other things. And so, again, my view is there's going to be competition. Uh, this is not a zero sum game over the next several years. You probably will have a power law curve that comes along um, in, in terms of in terms of um, adoption on this stuff. But just based on my experience um, working through many, many platform shifts, the platforms we're using at any given time can change. Everything was built on DOS at, at one point in time. Um, everything was built on Windows at one point in time. Then everything was built on the web. Then everything was built on iOS. Um, servers used to all be, you know, uh, you know, Unix. Uh, now a lot of servers are, are you know, are, are cloud or, you know, it's just that these platform shifts evolve and are constantly evolving. And so it's important that protocols for money on the internet and financial um, protocols, they, you, you, want your, you want your dollar to be cross-platform, right? You don't, you don't want to be locked into a single platform with your digital dollar. Where are you seeing the highest amount of transactional, like daily transacting users? Um, which, which L1 or L2 has been is seeing the most amount of USTC traction? Ethereum by far. Like by Ethereum. Ethereum, and Ethereum continues to be uh, the, the, the largest by far. And, um, and, and whether that's in um, just like general on-chain settlement, DeFi applications, NFT applications, um, you know, all of those very, very um, heavy. Now, one other thing that's notable, and we this is, I think, ties back to one of the other questions as well, is we've seen a steady growth in just everyday businesses that are adopting USDC as a payment and settlement mechanism. And they're adopting it on Ethereum L1 as well. And I think, you know, if you're, if you're you know, um, doing a payment, uh, a, a B2B payment, whether it's domestic or international, and these are multi-thousand dollar payments um, in, in a B2B context, the average payment sizes are much larger. You know, a $25 fee is not actually um, that significant. Um, mm -hmm. and, and, and the convenience, the speed, the interoperability, the reach, um, all of that is super powerful for people. Um, I think that's going to be a major trend in 2022 is more B2B adoption of absolutely like cross border supply chain trade finance. That's absolutely. Awesome. Yeah. And, and, you know, we, we have, um, the new circle account, which, which, um, uh, is, is, is still in beta, but will launch generally to everyone really soon. It is like a business bank account. It is designed to, you know, connect existing bank accounts, handle payments in and out. It's your digital currency storage for USDC. It's very, very focused on that payments use case. And it's a treasury account as well. And so you have cash management features, passive yield features. And I, again, for a business or a treasurer, that's like, I need, you know, a, 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 a streamlined way to do internet native dollar payments. And I want to do, you know, deploy into very simple self-service, um, you know, uh, you know, term loan kind of yields. It's a, it's a really attractive way to do that for businesses. And then, you know, we do all these APIs that allow people to weave it into their own infrastructure in, in highly bespoke ways. Awesome. Yeah. Could we talk, Jeremy, a bit more about the various ways stable coins are used? Originally, they were for exchanges that couldn't get US dollar bank accounts. So people wanted to trade out of their volatile Bitcoin or Ethereum into a stable coin. Um, you know, people could earn 13.5% in rewards depositing USDC at blockchain.com. So there's this rewards earning function, there's collateral on DeFi. What are you know, the use cases for stable coins today and, and maybe look into the crystal ball a bit and talk to us about things you're really excited about that's yeah. on the 12 to 24 month horizon. Absolutely. So, you know, as I like to say, when people say, well, what are the use cases for, for USDC? And I'll speak from, from USDC perspective. Um, I, I, I like to say, well, what are the use cases for a dollar? Um, and, you know, there, there's a lot of them, right? There's a lot of use cases. And, and, and actually today, 
if and you'd have to look at it like on a standard deviation right there really are you know there are people who are using it to 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 you know make payments for goods and services and there are people who are using it for extremely large international capital markets transactions right um you know at, at one end you've got people who are making micro payments for digital IP that they're purchasing, uh, you know, uh, on the internet, you know, in a, in, you know, a Solana NFT market or whatever that is. And, you know, that, that's a, that's a use case, micropayments for digital intellectual property. Um, and at the other end, you have people who are using it to settle, you know, half a billion dollar bilateral trades. Um, so there's a huge spectrum there um, uh, that, that's there. Now we see, uh, we, we see, a lot of use in what we call the digital asset market. So you see it as a fundamental market infrastructure for payments and settlement um, uh, between counterparties, uh, you know, on markets themselves, both centralized and decentralized markets. Uh, so very much um, as a fundamental dollar settlement mechanism. But what's really notable about USDC, stable coins in general, but, but I think USDC, um, uh, at least from what we've seen is it's very sticky. And so, um, you know, there's been, you know, well over hundred billion USDC issued. Um, and then there's been a lot redeemed, but we, you know, basically like you, you end up with uh, a, a kind of issue to redeem ratio where it ends up overall just increasing in circulation. Cause I think what people are finding is that they would rather stay in stable coin versus going back to legacy M2 electronic money because it has more utility value and it's, it has the ability to, um, you know, participate in other market structures that, that have evolved. And so that kind of leads to, you know, this is the programmable money and, and the Lego bricks of, uh, of composable building blocks of, of, of DeFi, but you, you're seeing all these market, you know, kind of primitives from, uh, to exchange, to lending and savings, to options and, you know, all, all these sort of mechanisms. And so people are, are passively uh, storing value, um, uh, you know, short term and long term, lending that value. And so you're seeing really robust interest rate markets that uh, emerge around it. And so there's kind of like a market structure that's building up. At the same time, we're seeing um, I mean, every, every day I get a stream of companies that are signing up um, for accounts with us. And, I, and it's, you know, almost every industry you can imagine um, where they're using it as a, we want to collect payments with this. We want to send and receive payments in this. We want to work with uh, suppliers or partners or employees or contractors. Um, I'm seeing that uh, happen more and more. Um, and so definitely seeing that. Now, I think the... Um, 2022, just getting back to the crystal ball side of this, um, I expect to see um, more and more significant internet scale um, consumer finance brands and internet scale um, you know, businesses who will adopt USDC as a payment medium. Um, and I think we'll see some significant things there. Um, now, does that mean everyone's going to be using that overnight? No. Um, but I think for, um, for, for some of these companies where, you know, recapturing 10 basis points or 20 basis points of cost could be a billion dollars of income uh, or more, um, it's very material, very, very material. And I think there is conceptually people now see because of third generation blockchains, I think because an understanding that this actually is going to be a, a legitimate cash equivalent financial instrument from a legal and regulatory perspective that is out there for people to use, that they're, they're realizing that, you know what, like this vision of like internet protocols for money, it's happening. It's not, it's not as you said at the start, it's like, it's here to stay. Um, and, uh, and they wanna be involved in, in that because it has such an impact on, on their business potentially. And that's not to talk about, you know, all the other things it unlocks, programmable money and smart contracts in commerce more broadly, like we're just scratching the surface for what that can mean. Um, the other thing that's interesting is that you've got the consumer starting to put pressure on their platforms themselves. So uh, I was reading a tweet this morning from Brian Chesky. Absolutely. Number one request from the community of Airbnb uh, rental renters is that they have cryptocurrency as a form of payment. 
And so yeah. um, you know, I think, like you said, you know, you're getting it both from the business case side and customers. Finally. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And and um, yeah, and they're visionary leaders in companies like Block and Dorsey, who uh, I think has, uh, you know, as I like to say, Cash App is the fastest growing retail bank in the United States. Is mm. I think now 60 million monthly active users. That's incredible. That's like they're going to pass Bank of America. They're going to be the biggest retail bank in the United States, and they're going all in on crypto, and um, and that's great, right? Because and and they're going to the, the, all those people are going to be like, oh yeah, of course, like I'm going to use this. Like why wouldn't I? And and then it's going to force people like PayPal and Venmo to be like, yeah, we're going to adopt this. Um, and 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 then you're finally going to be able to use you know uh, Cash App to pay someone who has Venmo, and that'll yeah. that'll be through <laughs> something like USDC. So dollars with wings, you have been doing the Lord's work on Capitol Hill. Um, so thank you. Uh, I'd like to talk a little bit about how that conversation um, is going and um, talk to us a little bit about your recent experience um, briefing uh, members of Congress about the vision for a digital dollar and why it's so much in the national interest of this country to continue to build a competitive form of global currency and why uh, blockchains and digital assets are going to be formative in that competition design? Yeah, that's a that's a that's a comprehensive question. Um, <laughs> I, I I think um, a, a few things on that. Um, you know, first of all, the 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 receptivity to thinking about and and paying attention to these issues from Congress, you know, from at least the members of the committee, like the House Financial Services Committee, which is really an important committee, um, is, is better than I've ever seen it. And um, it gets, it comes back to, to something that, that you led with Garrick, which was, you know, there are some stragglers who are not yet, who, you don't have to be a believer, but there, there are some people who are like, just, just kind of have such cognitive dissonance, they just think this is just all crap, it's just gonna go away. Uh, but there's now, I think, a general acceptance that this is here to stay. We better understand it um, because it seems like it's getting bigger. And we got to better understand it um, from an opportunity perspective and a risk perspective. And I think for the first time, members of Congress and the Senate, you know, and, and frankly, members in the White House and the administration are realizing that this is not all about risk which has been the, 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 if you've historically looked at the policy and regulatory discussions, it's all, it's all been like risk, 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 risk. It's also about opportunity. And um, the, to your question, one of the critical messages that I've been delivering to, uh, to, to leadership in the United States and in other countries as well, is that comes back to like, what are we really talking about here? these public blockchain infrastructures are like a major new infrastructure layer on the internet. It's a generalized general purpose infrastructure layer on the internet. That's going to touch every industry. It's going to have an impact on so many different ways that economic activity and, and non-economic activity can, can operate. It's an infrastructure that brings greater resiliency, security, transparency, auditability, privacy, integrity, it's like a, it's like a huge upgrade. It's like a missing layer of the internet. It's a huge upgrade. And so first and foremost, you just got to understand that this is critical infrastructure. This is, you know, if you thought the internet was strategic as a country, if countries think the internet and the role of that technology sector is strategic, this is like the next strategic layer and countries need to have strategies around this for being competitive in how it's it's used and adopted and stop looking at it narrowly through the lens of like, what are these commodities, these, these new wacky crypto money commodities people are trading. That's like, that's a real thing. You got to look at that, but look first, just realizing this is a really critical infrastructure. And then what are the, what are the things that are being built on it? And, and, and there, I mean, that's where I, you know, have emphasized that, you know, open internet infrastructure for the exchange of value using um, well-regulated forms of digital currency issuance are the fastest path available to the United States right now 
to lead in this next phase of the internet economy. And it's about understanding, this isn't just like a tightly controlled infrastructure that like a government runs or, or even a tightly controlled infrastructure that a small number of, of commercial firms run. It's the public internet, it's open source, it's a different model of, of, of infrastructure. But then it's, it's, so it's that open innovation that happens with that. But then it's, you know, I think significant private sector innovation on top of this, which is going to bring this to the point where it's, you know, can, can impact billions of people. And, um, and, and that is, that is a huge opportunity. It's a huge opportunity for every country. It's a huge opportunity for the United Kingdom. It's a huge opportunity for the European Union, for, for, you know, many, many countries, emerging markets too. So I, I think it's just reframing this in a national economic competitiveness and frankly, even national security context, mm -hmm. um, that is really, really important. And that is resonating with policymakers. Um, and, and that hasn't been, I haven't seen that resonance before. And so I'm, I'm, I'm really optimistic that you're gonna see um, nonpartisan uh, approaches to issues in this space over time. There's always going to be partisanship, right? But I actually think some of this, you know, I, I, I was, you know, very involved in the early commercialization in the internet, and it was very nonpartisan um, what, what happened uh, around, you know, do no harm and make sure this infrastructure can, uh, can, can thrive. Um, so I'm, right now I'm cautiously optimistic uh, based on the engagement that I have. <clears throat> That, that's a uh, that's a refreshing and and wonderful thing to hear because I know Jeremy in the past uh, you haven't always been as uh, as positive on the the regulatory outlook so so great news there um, I, I'm really excited about this part of the conversation and talking about um, central bank digital currency and stable coins and you touched on this a bit we we've heard from some Fed governors an openness it seems to uh, you know, not going the China route and having a very top-down central bank digital currency, centrally managed, you know, blockchain, you know, uh, whitewashed, you know, kind of uh -huh. uh, system, and, and maybe leveraging stable coins completely. I, w I wonder if you could talk about that that debate. Um, you know how that uh, you know fits with what's happening in Boston at the Boston Fed and the MI MIT Digital Currency Initiative work. And, and, and how you see maybe that playing out both here in the US and globally. Yeah. So um, relating uh, to, to some of the, to the prior comments, um, you know, one of, the, one of the things that, you know, we've talked a lot about and I've talked a lot about is, you know, I, I think there, there, there is currently in the West, um, a, a little bit of China envy um, that goes on, um, and and I think um, you 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 know you see the pace with which the Chinese government does certain things, builds certain things, the nationalization of certain things, and and how that works for them, and a a sense in the West uh, of you know we need to mobilize in a similar way. Um, now, um, when it comes to this topic specifically, I think the moment people like the Chinese are going to have this government run digital currency, um, I think one of the, that, 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 that then gets people that, that those competitive juices flowing, right. And people say, okay, if China's doing this, you know, we, we better do this. Um, and, um, it, it actually reminds me, I don't know if you remember the Trump administration, was was talking about nationalizing 5G infrastructure and just having the government do it because that was going to be more like how China was doing, it, right? You're going to nationalize the they're going to call it a military a, or whatever the hell they were going to call it, but they were going to you know to, to try and do that, right? And obviously industry pushed back pretty hard on that. Um, but I think there's an impetus along those lines. And um, my response uh, to that has been, wait a second, you know, First, and, and I testified to this as well, you know, first and foremost, like the United States is actually winning 
the digital currency space race, if you want to use that kind of metaphor, right? It's winning. The dominant fiat digital currencies in the world today are dollars. They're, they're doing trillions of dollars of transactions on the public internet today, driven by open innovation, private sector innovation, open source technologies, the open internet, which are technologies which enshrine liberal, Western market, open market ideals. So the, the West system, which is enshrined in, I think, ways the internet works and the openness of the internet and what that comes as well as private sector innovation, it's winning. It's actually winning by a huge margin today. And so the, an the answer to, the, the, to, to what, what China's doing is don't try to out China China, try and embrace what you already do really well and, and bet behind it and get behind it and look at what that can do. Because I think if you build on what's happening now in, in the open internet with private sector innovation, put a sound regulatory framework around it so that corporations, households know a dollar digital currency is, is always going to be redeemable for, for a dollar and that there are fundamental consumer protections and integrity checks and those kinds of things. Then, and, and allow open protocol innovation to keep flourishing. Within two to three years, the dollar is going to be the currency of the internet and we'll have won. And that's without a single line of code written by um, you know, a government agency uh, in the United States. So I, I think that's, you know, I, I think that message resonates as well. And I now to, to step back now, do, do I think that, um, you know, I, oh, let me rephrase. I think that government run electronic money initiatives for real time settlement will continue. They'll continue to grow. They'll continue to be more investments in RTGS e-money systems, which is what these central bank digital currencies are. They're not. Uh, for the most part, they're, they're, they're kind of designed um, in, in, in more of a, uh, you know, a, a dressed up e-money, a government run e-money. Um, and, um, but over the very long run, uh, I, I actually, I am a believer in central bank digital currency over the very long run. And the way I like to describe it is, um, you know, I, I, at one point I met with the uh, chief information officer of the Federal Reserve. And I, I asked him, I said, you know, what, what, what is the architecture of the dollar? Like, what's the, what's the tech stack? What is the dollar? Like the, the, the dollar is, is this ephemeral thing to people, but what is it? Well, it's actually a, a cluster of Oracle databases running on a, on multiple redundant clusters of Sun Solaris mini computers. I'm like, okay. So the dollar is this, that's what the dollar is. And so like when, you know, when the fed decides to go out and buy bonds it's like a SQL insert statement into that database that creates enough records to be able to go purchase those bonds. It's just a SQL database. And so that's the dollar and, and that's what it is. Um, and can I imagine a better architecture than that? Yes. Can I imagine an architecture that is cryptographic keys uh, and, and cryptographic ledgers that are at the core of that system as opposed to SQL databases. Yes, I think that that could be an improvement. It could be improvement on many levels. So cryptographic money can find its way into the core systems of, 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 of government money. And then the relationship of that to all these other layers upon layers upon layers that, that reach the real economy is, is, is sort of a whole nother discussion. Yeah, uh, and, and, and it keeps government maybe you know, out of the business of trying to design wallets and right. technology and these things that I think more people in government are recognizing it's this stuff's hard to do. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> well, and the, the, the power of an open protocol and the power of open source innovation and open and interoperability. I mean, the fact that like tens of thousands of different software apps can just speak a protocol and be interoperable, like you're not going to do, you're not going to see that happen with, with a, a government built initiative, right? Unless, you know, it's a totalitarian thing where you're just forced, you know, in, in, into this world. Um, and it's even interesting in China, like China's releasing their ECNY, you know, mobile app, but who the hell wants to use it? No one wants to use it. No one in China wants to use it. They're like, 
why do I want to use this? I would way rather use Alipay and, and Tencent Pay. They already have digital money, right? They have it. They like it. It's integrated into the whole stack of all the other services that they use to run their life. They have no need for it. And it's, it's, got, a real, it's got a real adoption issue, a huge adoption issue. Um, and the only uses that have happened are basically giveaways. They're like sweepstakes. They're like giveaways. Like get some, get some free EC&Y and, and, and do this. And so there's a real adoption issue. Um, there as well. Eric, last question. Yeah, so very specific. I, I've been for years dreaming of a product, Jeremy, where I can have a debit card with USDC on it that seamlessly um, is connected to, say, a DeFi rewards earning account or interest earning yeah. account of some kind um, that my, my salary is automatically deposited into it. Is this product finally going to come in 2022? And are the regulators so scared of it coming that they're going to stop it at all costs because they know that's going to tip the scales and uh, drive massive adoption? I, I think you, I mean, like uh, uh, there, there, are, there are things that are out there like that already, right? Like, like you know, you can get a Coinbase debit card. Hey, so I'll talk about one of your competitors there. But, uh, but you can get a Coinbase debit card that has, uh, you know, passive rewards and, you know, is all USDC and works with the debit on that. You see things like FTX, right? FTX has a debit card that uh, your USDC earns 5% um, and, uh, and it works over multi-chain and Solana and all this sort of stuff. So peer to peer is really fast and cheap. And um, so like, those are just examples, right? There are so many more that are out there um, and, like, you know, it's really interesting, you know, Visa and MasterCard, both are partners of Circle and both of them are supporting USDC more fully on, on their own networks and allowing settlement between issuers and the networks themselves in USDC instead of the legacy banking system. Like it's like getting into the even that layer. Um, and so the, the number of sort of USDC linked um, card products uh, is is growing fast. It's growing really, really fast, and 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 actually, the it's it's going into the core of even how the the, the card arrangements are are starting to support settlements themselves. Very cool. Oh. What exciting future ahead of us here for sure. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you, Gary. Thank you, uh, Jeremy. This has been a fascinating conversation. Um, I really appreciate your perspectives and all the work uh, that Circle is doing with USDC um, on the Hill and around the world. Um, we are definitely in a very interesting inflection point. And I think like reflecting on the past decade, you know, the, the crucible of effort across all the pivots, all the strategy development, all the product development, we've added a lot of muscle across the entire industry. Yeah. And um, I do think the future is bright. Embracing an open uh, development, uh, the innovation that's happening in our industry is going to bring billions of people into the economic sphere of the internet. And uh, that's a yeah. positive place to be. So. Thanks again for everyone um, that wants to follow up on this. Um, you can find it on our YouTube channel. It'll be available on Facebook, on our Twitter account. We'll be emailing it out as well, and it'll be available on all your favorite streaming services. So please subscribe, share, and uh, thank you everyone for joining us for the January 2022 Market Outlook. Thanks again, Jeremy. Thanks, you guys. Thanks, Jeremy. Cheers. Yep.